All right, thank you all for coming. My name is Alexa Lucci, and I work for a web and marketing agency just north of the city in Winchester. And I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, I was first introduced to WordPress when I was a senior in college. I was taking a web design course, and our teacher, we had a semester long project, and our teacher wanted us to build two websites in Dreamweaver. Uh, so needless to say, after about two weeks, I taught all my classmates WordPress and we did the entire two websites in about a week and a half. <laughs> uh, but I'm super excited, I've been part of the WordPress community, gone to a bunch of WordCamps with my agency and loved it, super happy to be here. Um, today I'm going to talk about how we should really, as designers and developers, take into consideration the end users and the audiences that are going to be using our websites. I think a lot of the times we are super excited to kickstart a project, get people in a room, try to get creative with it, and a lot of the time it's based off of mere opinion where we should really take into account some data and statistics as well as what our users think and what our users want before actually going to the drawing board. So that being said, this is me in a typical life at my web agency. I'm usually laying on the floor with the dog, but a lot of the time I am talking to clients, making sure that they're gonna get everything that they need. I'm the primary liaison for our designers, so making sure that at the end of the day, the ideal goal is to create a website that is great for the client as well as the client's audiences and users. Um, my nights usually on something like this, at my park with my coworkers, and our season's usually on something like this. I took a personal day for this one for Tom Brady. It's beautifulness. Um, all right, but let's get started. So today I'm gonna talk through sort of two different avenues and ways as to how you can create your websites with more of a reason and more of a purpose before doing so. And those are two different avenues, one being your audience focus, so hearing directly from those users that are going to be using the website on a daily basis, as well as data focus and more statistics and metrics. So making sure you're actually reviewing the benchmarks on your current website, so that way you can then, hopefully, in an ideal scenario, make a better new website moving forward. But again, it's just more so making sure that you have all of the data and all of the facts going into a design for a new website and making sure that at the end of the day, it's going to best serve everyone that's involved, not just your client. So for the sake of this talk, I have two personas here. We have Bob, who is a city mayor. He is more focused on those users and the user experience, the people coming to his website. He wants their experience to be great when they come visit, to have it be a accurate representation of his city and make sure that he is serving all of his community members as well as the staff members who are updating the website. He is really focused on serving his users and his audiences. He also loves to read in his hammock. And then we have Betsy. Betsy is more focused on her sales and revenue. She is more of a businesswoman. She is a CMO at a SaaS platform. So she's more concerned about selling, driving revenue, return on investment, and making sure that her new website is going to be a lead gen machine. She also has a pet cat named Gizmo. So we're gonna start off with Bob. Bob has an outdated site that's difficult to navigate. It's certainly not in WordPress, so it's super hard for all of his staff to update and manage. And he really just wants his website to serve all of his community, all the visitors coming into the city, anyone that's checking out the site, making sure that it's easy for everyone to access the information that they need. So he really wants to have a site that has a great UX and UI design. So to start, what he should do is ask the right questions. At our agency, what we usually do is we'll actually add on a what we call a discovery phase. So before we start any project or any process, we really try to take the time and um, enforce and really try to sell that the client should invest in these discovery phases because without having an understanding of what their users want and what the data proves, at the end of the day, it's a mere sense of opinion in terms of, we want it orange, we want Comic Sans. You don't really know unless you actually ask the right questions and have the data to back it up. So, Bob here should ask questions to his core users. Um, 
usually what we do is we'll start to craft a whole list of questions that we think Bob would benefit from getting the answers to. Um, questions like, how often do you visit the site? What device do you visit it from? Um, what are things that you typically go to the website for? Uh, what is hard to access? What takes too long to get to? Um, and then also get, after we get a good understanding on how they're using the current website, we'll also ask the core users what they would want in a new one. So, hey, well, let's put the ball in, in your court. If you were designing this website, I know you're just the user, but if you were designing it, what are things that you would want to see? What are things that you think should be on the homepage since you're the one using it? Um, are there websites that you like out there that you feel like are effective? Uh, are there things that you wish you could do online that maybe right now you can't? Just again, asking the users directly to see what their feedback is. Um, and then once we create all of the questions, we then make an online survey. Um, pretty standard, we have a bunch of free tools out there, which is great. We have Google Forms, Jot Forms, SurveyMonkey, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, but it's just a great way to be able to ask the right questions easy for your uh, users to fill out, and we really, really try to be um, really careful in how we structure the survey. I think we can all relate when you open a survey and it's 5,000 pages, you quickly X out and say, not today. Uh, so definitely being strategic in what questions you want to ask and making sure it's only the questions that you really, really need the answers to. Um, and then also making only certain ones required. Maybe you don't need to know the answers to some, but you definitely want to know answers to others, just being strategic in exactly what questions that you're going to ask. Another great way to build these surveys is using conditional logic, so only asking certain questions based on answers to the previous one, so again, when someone opens up the online survey, they're not, they're not being super overwhelmed with, this is a ton of questions, I don't want to take the time. So what we typically do is we'll create these online surveys at our agency and then uh, we'll share it to as many mediums as possible to try to get as many people to fill it out as we can. So we'll share it on their current website, we will share it on all of their social channels, we will um, email it out if they have a database to email it to whomever we can because again we just want to get a good <clears throat> cross section of people to fill it out. Sometimes we'll even incentivize it too. So we'll say, hey, we really want your feedback. Please fill us out. You'll be entered into an raffle because again, we really want a ton of submissions, as many as possible, to have a good cross section, which leads into my next point um, because this city mayor here, if he only hears from seniors in his town, in his city, then that's not really an effective data poll. So we want to make sure that we're hearing submissions from as many different types of people as we can, all, all different tech savvies. Um, people that are using it in different ways to then be able to have a good data set once we export all of the entries. Also, certainly want to make sure that we're hearing from the people making the updates to the website. So not just the front end users, but also the back end users to try to pinpoint any frustrations that have come from there as well. Um, and once we deploy the online survey, what we usually do is one of the questions in the online survey at the end will then be for people to opt into phone interviews. Um, again, this is just another layer of gathering feedback, but for us it's just been invaluable information as from our designer standpoint, they're super appreciative to actually hear firsthand what these people are experiencing on the current site. So what we'll typically do is we'll schedule phone interviews with a bunch of different users that are using the current website and again try to hear from them, try to elaborate on their feedback, have more of a conversation. And we found it to be really beneficial coming from a third party because if someone from the city were to call them, they might get a bit of skewed information. Um, so typically we try to get as, as much detail as we can over the phone to again add to that notes and the files. After we have the phone interviews, sometimes, again, we can dive in deep, even deeper and we'll have focus groups. So one example is we had a discovery phase for a school district in Massachusetts and I remember we had a brainstorming session with a bunch of parents and they were just feeding off of each other, coming up with a bunch of great ideas that if it's one person behind a screen in a one-to-one -one survey, they probably wouldn't have necessarily had some of the thoughts and ideas, so 
we found it really beneficial to, if you can, get a bunch of, of the actual users who are going to be using it into a room to then ask them the right questions, and then they can sort of bump, bump ideas off of each other um, and then really get even more of a holistic picture. But it was funny because in one of the in one of the sessions that we had, the superintendent walked in and wanted to sit in on it, and they're in from the parents, just silence, didn't have anything to say, so I actually had to excuse her so I could get that honest feedback. Um, at the end of the day, it'll, the superintendent was better off because she heard the information afterwards. Um, so another way that we do focus groups is you can certainly have the brainstorming format of a focus group, but what you can also do is your more typical focus groups where you can get people in a room, have them do some common tasks, have them talk out loud in, ter in terms of how it's going, how they're using it, if there's frustrations, if they think it's taking too long to get somewhere, um, and actually hearing that firsthand has been really beneficial for us. Um, there's also a bunch of um, paid services that you can do for focus groups if you wanted just strangers to test a site for you, but we found that it's really beneficial to have actual users who use those sites to then um, be the ones that participate in the focus groups. Um, so this is what a typical process, per se, would look like for someone like Bob. So typically what we would do is we would make a survey for him, post it, share it out to as many people as possible, flyers, everything you can do to try to get as many people to fill it out as you can. Then we would go in, have some phone interviews to dive even deeper, have people elaborate, um, and then have some brainstorming sessions. And once we have all of that feedback, then we would go in and website do a website revamp. Um, after that, it's sort of an ongoing conversation, so maybe we have a website prototype, and then we want to have another usability focus group saying, hey, here's the prototype we have. Is this what you were thinking? Is there more feedback now that you see a prototype? And then from here, then, I'm sure you're gonna get more feedback when people are using a prototype, because these are the same people who opted in to talk to you. Um, after you have their feedback, you can do another website revamp, make your changes to then be able to test and launch. And at the end of the day, this allows Bob to have a website with more of a purpose, considering he actually took the time to listen to his users, hear their direct feedback, and then address their concerns, rather than um, having stakeholders in a room and him come in and say, I know exactly what I want, I don't care what everyone says, at the end of the day, it's going to be a better end product for both you as the one delivering to him, as well as him delivering to his users. Um, he considered all of his user types, he allowed everyone to feel involved, so we've found that from a PR standpoint, it's huge for all of these organizations and municipalities that we run discovery phases for, because from a PR side, they're listening, they're opening the conversation, they're allowing everyone to feel as though their word is important and involved in the conversation. Um, so we basically have allowed for great information to be gathered, but then also when we usually provide the report at the end of the day, the actual client, it's usually invaluable. There's so many things that they wouldn't have been able to think of because a lot of the time it's not even their fault, they're just too close to it. They don't actually, they're not the ones that are the end users. So usually it's, it's just an invaluable document that we provide at the end of the day. So I'm sure you're all wondering, what about Betsy? Um, so, Betsy, like I mentioned earlier, she is far more of a data person. She wants the hard numbers, she wants sales, she wants revenue. Um, so she's interested in figuring out on her current website, where are the missed opportunities? Where can she optimize her site, make better calls to action, convert more, um, and then at the end of the day, just figuring out where there's areas for improvement. Because, again, she wants to close more deals and make more sales. So for Betsy, we're more focused on the tracking and the analytics side of things. Um, we're certainly going to take Google Analytics tracking, put it on her current site to then be able to try to review as many trends as we possibly can before going in and diving into a new website redesign. Um, so when we're considering Google Analytics, we always say from our agency to review the five W's, uh, the who, what, when, where, why. Uh, so the who being who visits your website. You want to know exactly where those who those audience are uh, in terms of their demographics, where they're coming from, gender, age, um, the actual location that they're coming from, and what the 
current audience workflow looks like. So what is that customer journey when they're coming onto their website? Which pages are they going to, et cetera? Which leads into the what. So what content are they looking at on the site? Are there particular pages that everyone's going to and then are there particular pages that no one's going to? Are, does she have a bunch of resources that are writing out blog posts every day and then when you look at the analytics, no one's reading them? Or are there particular posts that everyone's engaging with? So maybe there's particular topics that are well received to her customers. So maybe she should spend more time and invest more in those topics, things like that. Just making sure she takes the time to evaluate how the current site is working and performing to then make the best new website possible. Um, the when, obviously she wants to know when people are coming to the site, how long they're staying there, what the bounce rate is, when people are abandoning and jumping ship, um, just having that active users report. So also in Google Analytics, you can see exactly which users are new users, so coming to the website for the first time, versus people that are returning, so they've been there before. If you have, if your website is more skewed towards returners, then you know they're probably coming for that new content, new posts, things that you're adding to the site, whereas if she has more new users, then it's probably good for her because she's having new prospects come to the site, learn about her, etc. Uh, so it'll obviously be a case-by-case -case basis in terms of what her offerings are, but certainly things to, that you're going to want to review and know going into a design of a new website. She wants to know the where. She wants to know where people are coming from and how they're getting to the website. So are people coming from social? Am I spending so much time in social and no one's getting to my site from there? Then it probably makes sense to put your time and resources into something else. If everyone's coming organically, then maybe your news and your updates is working because you're adding pages, people are coming that way. Um, again, just making sure that you have a good understanding of where people are coming from, how they're getting to your site, because then when you spend the dollars and the investment in a new site, you want to know that information going in rather than just assumptions. Um, so ends with the why. You want to know exactly why your user experience is a certain thing, why your website is performing a certain way, and then it's, a, it's an ongoing review as far as Google Analytics go. So it's a great benchmark to have. As soon as you put the tracking on there, then once you make the new website, you'll be able to cross compare and see if there has been spikes or any differences made. Session monitoring is another sort of layer in terms of actually tracking and seeing how your site is performing. So these are two different tools that we've used in the past, one being Hotjar, one being Inspectlet, and they're pretty fair, fairly hot, um, priced. Some of them I think they have free trials, but it's basically essentially a uh, line of JavaScript that you just put on your current website, where then you can actually be a fly on the wall and record sessions as people are visiting the site. And it's all by IP address, so security-wise it's okay, um, but it basically will allow you to see exactly where people are going on the site, what they're clicking on, where they're scrolling, when they, what they look at before they click X, um, to actually, again, record, watch some sessions, and then be able to see if there's any overlapping issues or things that you can pinpoint before your website redesign. Both of these tools also have heat mapping capabilities, um, which basically means you can see exactly what people's eye movement is when they're visiting the website. Uh, so you can actually see if people are reading left to right, which areas of the website are they seeing, which ones aren't they seeing, uh, which would allow you when you're developing or designing it to then lay out your pages accordingly. So if no one is getting to any of the information below the folds, then you should plan accordingly in terms of what you're putting in which order on, on your page. And both Hotjar and Spectlet also have the ability to see um, the heat maps in mobile and desktop. So, so in some cases, they might be able to get to information on mobile and they're actually scrolling on mobile, whereas maybe on desktop they're not and they're not getting to that information. Again, just great information to know how people are interacting with the website to then make the best for the new one. Another great um, thing that we've done in the past is A to B testing as well. So maybe after she reviews the Google Analytics and watches some of the sessions, maybe she does have a better understanding as to why some things might be happening or maybe just has an idea of why things might be happening. Um, so A to, A to B testing 
those, who, uh, those of you who don't know, basically will allow you to create two different pages to then show randomly when people are visiting the site. Uh, so maybe you test out having an orange button with certain words in it, whereas the other page has a red button with different words in it. And then you can evaluate and see, was there any differentiation by having certain thing higher up on the page, did more people download it, things like that, um, to be able to actually have things side by side to then hopefully um, know going into the redesign, which is going to be more effective. Like, yep, we're going with orange, come the design meeting. Um, some other tools that we've used, again, this is diving even further um, into tracking capabilities, but there are marketing automation platforms out there. Some of the big dogs like HubSpot, Marketo, Sharp Spring is a smaller one, um, but it can basically allow for you to accurately track a user when they come to the site. Uh, so if someone fills out a form on your website, basically for the life timeline that they come to your website, you can always see how they're engaging with your content. So anytime they come, you can see exactly which pages they're going to, for how long, um, if they're looking at like a portfolio page and they, they're, they're just taking a lot of time on a certain portfolio page, maybe then they're interested in that part or service that you're offering. Um, same goes with blogs, so if you're writing a particular blog and you see that they keep reading, that particular user keeps reading, things like that, it would make sense for you to send an email, follow up, um, market to them in that particular way depending on their behavior. Um, so these timelines basically allow you to see exactly which content that they are enjoying, that they're subscribing to, um, so that way you can then nurture them accordingly in the life cycle of the lead. Um, live chat is another way to get great feedback. It's old school, but it works. Um, so a lot of people will put live chats on their websites. Olark and Drift are two popular tools that we've used, um, but it basically allows you to build rapport live with prospects in a virtual, digital, really not um, too intrusive way. So as people are visiting the site, you can say, hey, are there things you need help with? And then same thing, if there are pain points or frustrations and people are asking the same FAQs over and over via the chat, then you should probably move things around, take that into consideration. Again, just taking the time to really understand what the existing customer journey is to then be able to make the new one even better. So <clears throat> Betsy's complete process looks something more along the lines of this. Again, she's more concerned about the numbers. She's a numbers girl. Uh, so we would set up tracking for her, certainly gather as much Google Analytics numbers and data as we can. It's certainly depending on how much volume her website has, you might have to run it for a little bit longer. If she's getting thousands and thousands of hits on her website a day, you could probably have a smaller time frame in terms of the information gathering for Google Analytics. Uh, but at the end of the day, you just want to make sure that you have a large enough, wide enough window where you're actually seeing commonalities and it's not just super tiny. Um, monitoring, those session recordings are super great. You can actually know exactly what people are doing because in Bob's case, I can talk to someone, but they might say they come weekly, but really they're coming yearly and they're telling me something different. Uh, so having the actual hard numbers, actually seeing what people are doing is probably the most accurate way to go. Um, chat, talking to them, talking to as many users as you can, just really listening and hearing them out because we're serving them at the end of the day. Um, then once you have all that information, then you go into the website revamp, then you're ready to have your kickoff meeting knowing all that information, and then uh, you just have the benchmark. So you'll always have something to go back to to say, hey, we launched your website, now let's look back at how it used to look and what the feedback was before. Um, then certainly testing and launch. So now Betsy also has a website with a purpose because she tracked and monitored, she understands the performance, she evaluated how the business is doing on the web, uh, she optimized, she can now optimize it as best she can based on the actual analytics, not just assumptions. Um, and then she also can support her sales and marketing teams, like I said, with a better understanding of how people are engaging with the site, then she can say, hey marketing, make sure you're writing more content about this because people love it. Um, but Because otherwise if you don't review that, you really don't know. You're just blindly making content calendars um, unless you actually review the analytics. 
Um, I did want to have sort of a side by side here because I used two very specific examples for Bob being a mayor and for Betsy being a CMO. But realistically, Bob could be anyone in the municipality, organization, nonprofit type of space who really cares about his users and the people and the audiences coming to his site. Um, and Betsy can really be anyone, small, medium, large business, someone that's really focused on the actual driving of revenue. Um, and I did want to also mention is I made these two very specific tracks, but how we structure these discoveries is sometimes we'll do all of it. So certainly Bob should also be tracking and Betsy could also be talking directly to her customers and running surveys and having focus groups with her customers. It's not like a one, five, one size fits all approach. We structure our discoveries basically just hourly. So once we hear where the client is and what their industry is, then we usually can say, all right, we should probably check analytics. Maybe it doesn't make sense to do session recording. Maybe we should just do the surveys, have a couple of in-person brainstorming. Um, you can really structure them however you want. I just wanted to see two linear approaches to this. Um, but at the end of the day, I think any of these tools and doing any of these in your process before you go into a design meeting is gonna just be invaluable information for you and for your client. So where to go from here? Um, typically what we do after a discovery phase comes to an end, we'll do all our research, do all the information gathering, and then we'll put a pretty in-depth report of findings together um, that we can then give to the client so that way they know hey, going off um, hey, we're in the design meeting, let's first review the report of everything everyone has said of what they want in the new website. So then that really leads the conversation. It's not just bumping heads on, oh, I saw this site one time, I think I like it that way, or I think I want a slider, I don't know. Um, it just really allows for the hard facts and the actual information to then lead the design conversation, um, which ultimately will provide you with an improved website. I did want to just show, just these are just a couple of pages from a report of findings that our agency did, just so you can have an idea. Usually we'll have a huge Word document or spreadsheet of all the information, surveys, and then we have beautiful designers create beautiful artworks and actually make it into more graphic-centric um, pieces, so that way it's easier to digest and easier to really see what the takeaways are. Um, so this was an example of the school district that we did in Massachusetts. As you can see, first we highlight the cross-section of people that we spoke with in terms of parents, residents, employees at the schools. We talked to all different um, schools, so we got feedback from the elementaries all the way to the high school because certainly the parents in the elementaries want different things than the parents in the high school, let me tell you. Uh, so the different age groups and just making sure again that you have a good data set to go off of. Um, this is another page, so website feedback. Certainly want to know how often people are going to it, and if people are saying they're never going, then conditional logic, we usually say, okay, what would, what would be on the website that would cause you to go more? Or if they're going frequently, we then say, what are you going to the website for? Things like that. Um, but having a good understanding going in on what the usage is for the current website. Um, we also will have them rate things on a scale, so usually that's an easy and a quick question to answer, write a number, write the stars, uh, anything radio buttons, usually people are more likely to fill out, um, but we've asked different ratings in terms of how easy is it to access information, what's the usefulness of it, so is it outdated when you go to the site, um, and then what's the likelihood to recommend it, pretty standard questions there. Um, and then website feedback, so what are the reasons that you visit the website? This is a huge driver in how we lay out a new website once we know this information because Okay, for this school, for example, they want, number one, information on school programs and services. So we're certainly going to put all the news and updates above the folds and make sure that all the timely information is at the top. Then their second most important thing was staff contact information. They were using a PDF of a staff directory in a table Excel sheet. Certainly not helpful for most parents who want to just click to call to report an absence. So that was something that we wanted to build new functionality into. Upcoming events, same thing. They were using a really outdated calendar, so certainly took the time to make the Google Calendar, um, to make a good iframe that actually looked good with some styling, to then add that into the new site. All of these other things, lunch menus, um, minutes, procedures, homework assignments, 
if we didn't really ask these questions, then we wouldn't know what quick link should be on the home page. Where should this go in the navigation menu? Um, just all great information to have before we kick things off. And then we have website suggestions. Certainly in the phone interviews and in the actual in-person meetings that we had with some of these folks, they had lots of quotes, lots of feedback. Um, so a lot of it is just being a, a listening ear, but it's, it's really great at the end of the day. Uh, so these are just some of the top things that we heard time and time again from the school district. Uh, their mobile experience wasn't good, all right? We gotta build mobile first, which we always do. Um, but navigation and search was important to them, a teacher directory, a form builder if they wanted to do more things online because a lot of the stuff was finding forms in their kids' backpack, which got lost half the time. Um, but making sure that more things were accessible on the website. So just, again, taking the time, hearing them out. Um, these are very passionate parents. Um, so last thing is it's always great information to learn, but for us as an agency, for this being an offering, um, it's been a huge revenue builder for us because we can pretty much add it to any phase and any process at the beginning, and it really allows for the client to feel like they have more of a partnership with you rather than it just being a one-off, hey, I'll make you a website, I'll design it, thanks, here it is, it's set up. Um, you're really taking the time to learn about them and learn about their users and learn what their goals are, and you're creating those benchmarks so that way later, a year out, you can say, hey, your website's been out for a year, let's run another discovery phase, let's see how things are going. Um, it's been just like a very repeatable process for us that we can then always offer to our clients. These are just the tools I mentioned. I will share this in a post that way everyone can see it. Um, tracking tools, analytics, hot jar, and Spectlet. Testing tools, definitely having user focus groups as often as you can. A to B testing, device testing. The feedback tools being the different chats, um, Olark and Drift and then really taking the time to talk humanistic person to person on, hey, what would you like? What would you like to see via phone interviews and brainstorming sessions? And then certain survey tools, Google, Google Form, SurveyMonkey type form, you can get a little more personal with it, which we like, uh, and then job form. Um, and then sometimes if we have already created a WordPress site, we'll just use Gravity Forms for the next um, discovery that they end up using. Questions? This is me and my little dog. <laughs> yes. Uh, for your focus groups, is there um, like do you have a general strategy for any focus group that you run, or is your focus group strategy different based on your clients? Um, usually, it will be sort of a case by case basis, but there's some standard things that we will um, ask. I think a lot of it will come first from the online survey, so we'll usually do the online survey just first and foremost, get at least some background information on what the pain points are, and then in the focus groups we'll have, okay, we heard a lot that people are oftentimes trying to find the events coming up and they can't find it. So then in the focus group we'll make sure that, hey, go try to find X event that's happening in two weeks and then see how long it takes them to make sure that, again, that the new website will like meet the expectations of what the problems were and make sure that the solutions are happening. Do you send your surveys in advance of the group meeting? Or yeah, so we'll do, we'll do the online surveys usually for like maybe a month or two and then from there we'll have some phone interviews and then we'll have the focus groups a little bit later, almost like a phase two. Thank you. Yeah, because we want to have some of the data going into the focus groups because otherwise it is sort of a, I, I hope I'm going to ask the right questions, you don't really know. Um, so it gives us more of a background going into the focus groups to say, all right, we want to make sure that Coming out of this focus group, we know that this is going to be easy for people to do, things like that. A good question. Thanks for the, um, the, the suggestions like the, the uh, hot jar and the yeah. other. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on something like that for A-B testing? Like a, mm, a yeah, there are. There are. I don't know off the top of my head, but I know there's a bunch out there that you can actually run the testing. And then I know in um, Google Analytics, you can actually just do the sort of like at the experience experiments, and I think you can actually do a lot of it from Google directly in terms of the Google experiments. You can say, okay, Google, um, load this page versus this page and have them swap and have it be random. I think there is some things that you can do there directly. But. Yes? This is a definition. Do this content calendar, is it like a typical marketing term? Content yeah, 
content calendar in the sense of, yes, if you're, if you're a business and you're marketing, then usually looking ahead. So let's say, okay, next month, what are the things that I want to publish on my website, uh, on social, and making an actual calendar so that way you can make sure that you have a good cross-section of things that you're sharing out. So you don't want to just blindly be writing posts that don't really have any strategy behind them. So actually taking the time to make a calendar to say, okay, let's have this post be relative to our culture. Let's have this post be relative to realtors. Let's have this one be relative, you know, just making sure that you're actually having a good um, variety of posts. So usually what we'll do is we'll make like a content calendar to then make sure we're checking all the boxes in terms of the types of content because the more variety, then the more the analytics will show, okay, we did five different style posts and two of them were great and then the other three no one liked, so let's do more of the first two. Um, so usually we find doing the content calendars and laying it out and mapping it out usually helps to then be able to review and have a better understanding on the same thing, like what your users really want and what they care to see. Yeah. Uh, great job Thank on you. this presentation. Thanks. It's, uh, I've attended several UX conferences and I think this one has been the best one. Thank you. Uh, there's a curiosity in regards to the survey. Like you, I, I, practice something very similar mm -hmm. on uh, getting an understanding on what's on the other side of the table. Right. And uh, we find that the, uh, users to participate on these online surveys tends to be a little challenging. Mm -hmm. you Super shared, passionate. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, you shared how you'll conduct it for about a month or two. So my yeah. curiosity is and the way that I think we've manipulated it is by looking at a high traffic page on a website and create a pop-up. And that pop up. Yeah. Kind of like yeah, like that exit pop up. Yeah, so I was curious, are there other ways that you've been that you found that has worked better than others? Uh, whether it be an email database, whether it be social media channels of the company. Yeah. Um, usually we find that it's better to be on the existing site. Like to your point, if the site if it if it works well with others, being able to do an exit and ten pop up or something like that because it's more beneficial to get them when they're visiting the website rather than sending them an email. Maybe they haven't gone to the website, whereas if they're looking at the website right now, they're probably more apt to say, all right, I'm pulling out a survey. I don't like this. Um, to give like their actual live feedback rather than you know, so we're emailing it, they'll say, okay, let me go check it out. And it might be like an after the fact that they're filling it out. Um, so we usually find if it's on the current website, that's the best route as long as it allows you to sometimes. You know, websites are super ancient, it's hard for us to make it prominent. Um, but I would usually say, if you can on the website, do it there. Um, but sometimes if the traffic is super low, you have to use the other mediums to get people there. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. With the city mayor too, we were like printing flyers, tacking them up, whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> Sharing the wealth, please fill it out.